It is a phenomenal property, and it carries on the spirit of Star Trek. We're going to talk to the cast of Star Trek Continues tomorrow, and the moderator for your panel this evening is a member of the Star Trek Continues cast. Please give a massive, massive welcome to Miss Michelle Speck. Michelle! Thank you, thank you, thank you, Devin. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Who is excited? I am so excited. I am here with you. We are here to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Star Trek Voyager. I can't believe it's been this long, but we're going to have a wonderful time, and I just don't want to waste any time. Let's just get right to it. What do you think? Should we introduce everybody? All right, coming up first, fabulous, fabulous, Manu Interemi. Ichab, let's give him applause. That was planned, and he executed it perfectly, perfectly, just like rehearsal. Next up, Mr. Ethan Phillips. Woohoo! Yes, yes. Next up, everybody's favorite forever ensign, Mr. Garrett Wing. Long. <laughs> and my favorite and your favorite doctor as well, Mr. Robert Picardo. Let's give a round of applause for Commander Chicote, Mr. Robert Beltran. That's right, Bobby. That's right, Bobby. It's a very serious cast, as you can tell. Very serious. All right, everybody's favorite, favorite Vulcan, Mr. Tim Ross. Yay! We made it! That's right, Kimbo. Ladies and gentlemen, the first female captain in any Star Trek show ever, and personally my favorite and your favorite as well, Miss Kate Mulgrew. <laughs> Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, we do have a mic set up right down here, so if you'd like to start lining up for questions, please do so. We'll get to them in a minute. But just to start off with, I'd like to ask a general question of everybody, if that's all right. Um, over seven years, as you reflect now, 20 years later, I would love to hear uh, a favorite or fondest memory from each of you of your experience on the show, um, either in front of or behind the camera. Who would like to start? <laughs> We will have oh. to be, yeah, I'll, let me start, because then I'll be done. <laughs> it's, it's friendship. It's just about that simple, because you're with these people day and night, right? And as you can see, it's a lot of testosterone. <laughs> but I weathered that storm, and I'm still standing. And I'm grateful to each of you gentlemen. What's your name? <laughs> friendship, I love them. Uh, something very similar. I, when I first showed up the, on the sound stages uh, on the Paramount lot, the very first day that Rick Berman and the cast was going to get together and they were going to show us all the sets and everything, I met uh, the first person I met in the cast was Ethan Phillips. We walked from the parking lot down that narrow alley between the sound stages to get there. Uh, the very last day that I packed up my trailer uh, and left the sound stage and left the, left the lot for the last time, uh, I walked down that same alley with Ethan Phillips back to the car. Yeah, it's a true story. And uh, that was, that's a very poignant moment for me. I, I wanted to take the flute home 
because it was that flute sound that was that was always around when Chakotay showed up on the scene. <laughs> I wanted that flute, but they wouldn't let me have it. Nevertheless, I have to second uh, Kate's remark. It's it's about friendship, working with a great cast and a great crew, and great fans. Well, there, there are children in the audience, so I can't discuss the real nature of the, of the Tim Russ and Ethan Phillips relationship. <laughs> it was hell to witness, I gotta tell you. Um, <laughs> every year on the show, because our captain is Irish, we got treated to a uh, St. Patrick's Day dinner Woo! by our captain, Kate Mulgrew. We got corned beef and cabbage. And a bottle of whiskey. A bottle of whiskey. <laughs> a bottle of Jameson's Irish whiskey every year. Something to look forward to every season. Um, so there was that. Because the one thing that really helps friendships, as you know, is a bottle of Irish whiskey. <laughs> so I thank Kate for that, too. So I will second the friendship leavened with a little, uh, a little extra zing. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Oh, wrong cast. Sorry. All right. Um, I would have to say um, it was. It has to do with when we were getting our action figures. Our our first set of action figures, the six-inch action figures. They told us, okay, it's going to take us a year to get them all done. And um, my friends were telling me they were like, yeah, we're going to buy your action figure. And we're going to do voodoo on them, and you know, do that kind of stuff. So I laughed about it until the day they actually knocked on my trailer door and handed me my action figure. It was you know, CBS, Paramount Marketing, and they're like, here, here's your action figure. So I pick it up, I look at it, I see myself in six-inch plastic, and I start shaking, and I get overwhelmed, and I start tearing up. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. <laughs> this is my action figure. And as I'm about to have this moment where I'm actually going to cry over it, Robert Beltran walks behind me, looks over my shoulder, and goes, hey, man, you look Mexican. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Ruined it. Ruined it. Touching moment, ruined by the commander. Okay. That's a great story. I didn't even know that. Um, you know, there's a lot of memories that come to mind. Um, we had so much fun on this set. Um, and I didn't know we were going to have fun. That When I found out we were going to have fun, I remember it was the very first show. And uh, I had a little scene on the bridge with Robert McNeil. And we had pads. Remember the pads? And they're spelled in the script... P-A-D-D, -D, with two Ds. And uh, we're doing the scene, and Robbie turns to me, and he goes, Neelix, could you pass me the pad? D -d -d -d. <laughs> and he's got a little smile in his eye. And I said, okay, we're going to have some fun on this show, aren't we? <laughs> I've got a funny memory from... Uh, I was sitting in my car at the, the, the last episode, and I hadn't talked to anyone because I just had one scene where I beat... Tim at a game of uh, Kaplupal. Kalto, thank you. Um, and I was so proud of that, um, just to be smarter than Tim. Um, so I actually was out in my car and I was watching Tim and Ethan walk to their um, respective places and have my binoculars out. Um, well, that's not the story I was going to tell, but actually um, I was in my car watching you too. Um, I... I I was on the haunting of deck 12, this guy. I mean, any time the boys were on set, we, we never got anything done. That's why we shot 16-hour days, is that we just, everyone made jokes all day long. This one's reading to the children, and he's supposed to say, uh, I even remember the line, I'm going to read you a story. Flutter meets the invisible vertebrae. But instead of saying that, on camera with a bunch of, with the six-year-old kids, five-year-old kids, he goes, I'm going to read you guys a story. My pet duck farts too much. Yes, you did. And the kids started laughing to the point where every time he said that line, I think it took 35 takes because they couldn't stop. You don't, you know, you don't share fart jokes with kids. Well, yeah, they love it, but then we can't shoot the rest of the, the day. I couldn't help myself. Just for a second. Everybody, if you do have questions, there's the microphone right here. Please line up and we'll get to them, of course. In the meantime... 
Kate, I'd love to ask you a question, just from a um, visual standpoint as a fan. Um, there was a marked difference, for me at least, in the commanding style of Captain Janeway at the beginning of the show, and then very soon afterward. We saw a shift between season one and season two. There was a difference in her, in her commanding style, and who she was. I would love to know if you had a part in that. Was that a conscious decision? Was that something, and if it was, did you have a part in that decision? That's called exhaustion. <laughs> I did have a part, because uh, in the first season, they were just so upset by the fact that I was a girl. They couldn't get over it, that I had bosoms and, you know, hair. What are we going to do with all that hair? <laughs> and so they were always touching me and fooling around with me. I couldn't, you know, really, how many hairdos did I have in the first four season? Five at least. Yeah, four five. Ridiculous. Captain Janeway was really busy trying to get out of the Delta Quadrant. Oh, let me just do my updo and then I'll get my hope do. <laughs> so I finally went to them and I said, please, can I just command? And I think they were so tired by then. And they said, yeah, give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. And then I, it all just sort of relaxed and took off. I had a great time. Yeah. Yeah. So you wanna... Not on. Do we have a tech? There we go. <laughs> Welcome to Houston. Thanks. And uh, on behalf of I know all the fans, we thank y'all for just continuing the Star Trek legacy because it, it was just an awesome show. As an educator, I always like to ask successful people as yourself. Did, do you have, did you have someone that inspired you, a teacher, a mentor, someone that inspired you to be who you are now? Don't all go at once. Well, I, uh, <laughs> I'll never forget, uh, what's his name? Um, <clears throat> <laughs> no, if I, I, when, I, when I was in high school, I remember I wanted to play football, but I was a little guy, so I couldn't play. And uh, I said, well, I'll, I'll audition for the drama club. And I went in, and they were... Uh, doing the uh, high school production of The Scottish Tragedy, mm -hmm. which you all know. Macbeth. And <laughs> go outside, turn around three times, throw salt over your shoulder, and ask permission to come back in. Well, that, that's the one, this though. is not a theater, is it? And, um, and so I was auditioning for Old Seaward, who has basically two lines in the fifth act. And what it is is they come up, but somebody comes up to Old Seaward and says, Lord Seaward, your son has been cut in half and lies slain on the battlefield. And old Seaward's response is, he is dead then? <laughs> um, but in fact, it's not supposed to be read like that. And I read it, he is dead then. And the priest, I went to a Jesuit prep school, he said to me, no, son, you don't understand this man's child has just been killed. And I want to see in your reading of that line, I want to see a little passion, and I want to see some sadness, and I want to see some anxiousness and, and, and confusion. In other words, how would you react if you learned your child was killed? And I remember as a little boy thinking, oh my God, I just got to pretend that my little boy was killed. And so I summoned up all the passion I could and I read the line. And this priest looked at me and he said, you're very good, son. And that was what set me on feeling that I could do this. It was the first time in my life anybody told me I was really good at something. And it just goes to, I'm. He's dead then? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Just like that. Now, the priest was psychotic and was eventually arrested and sent to a mental institution. <laughs> but that's not part of the story. So that priest, I can't, Father, Father McBride. And so he was the guy who set me on my path. So how about you? Uh, well, um, I had an, uh, an English teacher uh, in high school whose name was Shakespeare. <laughs> not, a, not a joke, Edward Shakespeare. And he directed all the school plays. He had lost an arm in the Korean War. He was a very interesting and slightly scary figure, incredibly handsome, was a silver fox like Mr. Beltran here. That's right, um, That's But right, he had that, that hair and, and then a big metal arm, and he was a little scary when I was a younger student, but he, uh, he somehow I was uh, coaxed into the school play by the biggest ham in the class, a guy named Bill Barker. Bill, Bill was one of those kids who grew taller than everybody else first. And he was a clown, a class clown, and he needed someone to set up his jokes in a, in a two-character play. So I was hired to be, I was hired, I was pushed into being <laughs> his straight man. In other words, I had all the, uh, all the sort of setup lines for his play in the ninth grade school play called Box and Cox, which is not a dirty play. Uh, it was about two guys who lived in the same apartment and didn't know it because their landlord, who wanted double the rent, 
One of them worked in, by day and one worked by night. So it was a silly, farcical play. And he played the, uh, you know, he played the guy, the big bust, blustery guy, and I had to play something different than him. So that's where I played my first sort of a feat, uptight, officious character, just like I did on Star Trek. <laughs> um, and uh, and I loved, I got laughs too, and it, and I was bitten with the bug about that age. And then Mr. Shakespeare, our teacher, saw that I was talented in comedy, and then he pushed me as the years went by to do different uh, different roles, culminating in senior year with uh, forcing me to do the lead in The Crucible, which is a very dramatic play, which I was afraid of doing. And then at that, and I saw that he was trying to get me to see whether my interest in being an actor was, was uh, genuine or not. So I credit him with being my mentor at that age. Well, I was, no. Why wasn't <laughs> I up for that? Complete failure. I don't know if I can say I had mentors. I know I had dementors. Um, <laughs> I had a coach. I loved playing baseball. I had a coach that could never get my name right, and it's not that, really not that hard. But he would say something like, Belger, get in there. <laughs> so you, mean, you mean me? Get in there, Belger. <laughs> or it would be, Belgerman, get in there. <laughs> so after our last game of the season, After the last game of the season, I walked up to him and I said, Coach, it's Beltron! <laughs> he said, get out of here, Belger. <laughs> that is funny, man. I'm sorry. Oh. That is funny. I, I uh, had a, I, my professor in college was one of the, one of the people that I really um, admired and adored. Um, it was Edward Mangum. He founded the Arena Theater, co-founded the Arena Theater in Washington, D.C. And the theater that I was uh, studying in was in Texas. It was in Austin, actually. And uh, and uh, on my undergraduate school, he was the he was the professor. He was the uh, the head professor of the of the theater department. And he and I just he was a wonderful guy. He's tra classically trained, had a wonderful dry sort of sense of humor. And he he and we do, I remember he, he always said one thing. He said, "Whatever you do, he says, make them cry, make them laugh, make them angry. Just don't bore them." That's all he used to say all the time. And I love, I never forgot that actually. You know, give him, give him something. He was a wonderful professor and that was one of the people that I, I studied under and uh, was very happy to have that opportunity. You never did forget that. No, I did not. Thank you. You're excellent. Okay, another question? Yes, sir. Uh, so I wanted to know if there was ever a, a scene or a storyline that you wanted to take away from one of the other characters, either because it was like more fun or because you thought you could do it better than them, that sort of thing? <laughs> it, would Next it, would make for, it would make for an interesting episode. All well, of us I, playing I, everybody else. You know? No, I, I'll say something to that. Hold on. Um, I just tell you that every time that we had any scenes where we got to go down to Earth and have different clothes than our horrible Starfleet uniforms we had to wear. Who got left on the ship? Me. <laughs> so I just watched as these folks got to wear modern 20th century clothing when they went onto Venice Beach. Yeah. I watched when other people were doing the Hirogen. Remember the Hirogen episode where everyone was in the holodeck? Some people got to wear World War II stuff. Some people got to dress as Klingons. And who got to wear that horribly tight Starfleet Hot, sweaty, scratchy, itchy, wool blend, Starfleet issue uniform. Me. I am not married, I do not have kids, but when I get married and if I try to have kids and I find out that I cannot have children, <laughs> I'm going to sue Paramount Studios because those Starfleet uniforms are made to fit perfectly when standing up. The minute you sit down, it pulls in one place, right here. So you may hear about a lawsuit in the future. Maybe not. Thank you. I remember that Garrett and I used to uh, audition uh, as the doctor often. Um, we were always auditioning to be the doctor. Uh, All right, come on, let's hear it. I practiced as soon as I got onto the set. Hello, everyone. Is that yours? Isn't it a lovely day? So, where are my lines? And I hope they're funny. <laughs> and I, Garrett had his I get to I audition too. Can I, do, can I audition as a doctor also? Yes. Okay, ready? <clears throat> Hold on. 
Just remember, Kess, anybody can stargaze on the bridge, but the real action happens in sick bay. It's, it sounds, it sounds like I'm on helium. <laughs> all right, if you really want to audition. But we all, Garrett, we all do. All of your impersonations are on helium. <laughs> no, you never, yes, you do. <laughs> Listen to him do me, do me. Yeah, do it, come on. Go on, go on, but not on helium. Kate Mulgrew just I said, do me, you. do me. <laughs> Did you hear that? Robert, Picardo, Picardo, in sorry, the front I'm sorry. row, tiny children. They said there was a lot of testosterone on set, and she right. thanked every one of us. Do you remember that? Do you hear that? Okay. All right. It's not crunch time yet, Mr. Kim. <laughs> <laughs> There's coffee it's... in that nebula. That's not helium. That's a lot of helium. Is that how I sound? <laughs> Captain! <laughs> Wonder why you never got that promotion. Oh, oh my. <laughs> Robert, Robert Beltran had a very difficult time uh, memorizing his lines because he didn't bother. Um, <laughs> and he would sometimes put them on the bottom of his coffee cup. And uh, he did. He'd go, Captain, uh, there's a... Corned beef sandwich on deck 11, uh, or whatever it was. Yeah. But he'd forget his lines, and he'd always go... We had a script supervisor named Cosmo, and Cosmo was the one you'd call if you needed your line. You'd go, Captain, I think, Cosmo, what's my line? <laughs> I, I, I think there's a... Whatever the crack supervisor had, whatever the lines were. And you were... Cos you asked Cosmo a lot, and Cosmo was... So Cosmo, I, once I actually called Rob, Robert at home and got his answering machine, and it said, Hi, this is Robert. Cosmo, what's my name? <laughs> And I realized he had Cosmo back at his house telling him what to say. True story. <laughs> I, I have Robert's name written inside my hat, and that's why I'm sitting next to him. Um, so this is a question specifically for Mr. Picardo. I really loved your role because not only were you playing a doctor in a hologram, you were, you know, you're on this emotional roller coaster of you know, becoming more human and trying to figure out more emotions. Was there ever a time, um, say, when you were getting ready for your role, is there something specific you did to get, maybe get ready for that, to be able to keep that straightforward attitude but still show that you're learning emotion? Did you ever find that hard or anything you did specific? No. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. It's a, um, I, I wouldn't have considered it an emotional roller coaster. That, thank you. I mean, when I first, when I was cast in the show, I called everybody I know and said, I got a good job. It'll, it's a Star Trek series. It'll run seven years. It'll put my children through college. But I have to tell you, I have the worst part on the show. <laughs> the worst. Here's how it's described. Colorless, humorless, a computer program of a doctor. Does that sound like a lot of laughs to you? It sounded awful. And then, but when I, and, and in the first episode, I just said things that were, I mean, I got a laugh saying, medical tricorder <laughs> to him. And then I just realized that all I had to do was sound pissy and... <laughs> because the idea that a computer program had a bad attitude was a funny idea. So it, it, it dawned on me that I had lucked into something a lot better than I had understood at the time. But, uh, and, and what was fun was because Data, you know, Star Trek loves to give you something you've liked before, but tweak it a little bit. And Data, of course, had no emotions until he got to the big screen. I was hoping that I would get, I'd get to the big screen and get something new too, but I never did. But he, he got his emotion ship at the end or whatever the heck that was. And you know, I, and I knew that I was following a very popular character. Data had been so popular on the show. And you know, so I tease Brent, I say to him, you know, you, you know, you were just, you were like a robot, right? I mean, I never saw you on the show, but I hear you were just a ro you just like, you know, you know, a danger, danger Will Wheaton, you know. <laughs> Hi. Um, well, I was going to ask why poor Ensign Kim never got promoted, but I guess I know the answer to that one now. Um, what is the strangest thing any of you had to do for a role? For any role? Oh, for God. any role. <laughs> I, auditioned, I auditioned for Leonard Nimoy um, before Voyager. And I, I got... 
three pages of a scene for a Klingon captain, and his name was like Kothlukluk, <laughs> Captain Kothlukluk, <laughs> and um, I had to go over to Leonard Nimoy's house in Brentwood. I live way across the other side of town, and. Um, all I, ha I didn't have the script. I didn't have the whole script, just my three, three, scene, uh, three pages. And so I walked into his, his room, and there were like 20 producers sitting around in, in a round table, and there was one seat in the middle for the, the uh, person who was going to be auditioning. So I sat down, and I uh, looked at all these people and uh, tried to be amiable, and um, one of them asked me, do you have any questions? And I said, well, uh, well because I never watched Star Trek. I said, well, um, yeah, uh, well, what is a Klingon? <laughs> now, um, le uh, it, was a, it was a sincere question. I thought it was kind of uh, um, intrinsic to the, to the part, so I wanted to know what a Klingon actually was. And so uh, Leonard just goes. <laughs> I could see his ears growing. Shall we just read? <laughs> so I did the stupid scene. I walk outside and a buddy of mine is getting ready to audition for the same role. And he, he saw me fuming. He said, hey, what, what happened? I said, you know what? I asked a stupid, I asked a question. And they wouldn't, they got so pissed off at me. I said, what is a Klingon, man? <laughs> and he laughed. Like, I mean, he just busted up laughing because you auditioned for Leonard Nimoy in Star Trek and you don't know what a Klingon is? And so I was like, F a Klingon, F Nimoy, F Star Trek. <laughs> the screen door was wide open and all of them were looking at me like... <laughs> that might be the uh, strangest audition I had. <laughs> I had a, uh, an audition where my agent called me and told me you're auditioning for a character who is the angriest man in the world. And that's how it was described. The angriest man in the world. And I went over to see Gail Eisenstadt over at NBC. And I walked in the room and I read for her. And she said, that was wonderful. Can we do it again a little less angry? <laughs> I was like the angriest man in the universe. I don't know. I, I have a I had a callback for an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie called The Sixth Day, and I had to do a dying scene. And um, I had on shorts, because I was a hippie kid with, a, with a, a mullet at the time. Yeah, I know, that was pretty strange in and of itself. Um, but I, cro I decided, so stupid, um, do you guys know that producer with the red hair? He's a mega famous guy. But anyway, he's producing the film. And it's a round table, it's, a, it's you know, in a... A, a room with a, you know, a big, big desk and a bunch of suits around the table, table and Arnold's sitting there. And the first thing he says is, Ente Reme, what kind of name is that? And I go, well, what kind of name is Schwarzenegger? Which was the first uh, mistake. He said, it means black plowman, which I thought was sort of a racist name. Um, and so I, oh, it got worse. Then at the end of it, I decided that I was going to be really dramatic, and I crawled up on the table of this expensive, you know, highbrow suit, Hollywood suits office. And I did this really dramatic death scene in front of Schwarzenegger and the rest of them. They're all looking at me really bad. And I realized that when I left, that I was laying up on the table with my shorts on, and I was showing Schwarzenegger my Borg balls for the most. So I didn't get the part. But it was the strangest thing I've ever done in an audition. Wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Why did you not get the part? I, I, <laughs> Thank you so much. Let's Thank take you. another one. Who's Here next? Here we go. Um, before I ask my question, I just want to tell Kate, you've been amazing in Orange is the New Black. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I think you should always walk around with talking in a Russian accent, which is, it's amazing. It's very intimidating. But my question for everyone is, would y'all come back and do a reunion episode? And what would it take to do that? What, what would the story reunion. be? A reunion episode. 
Would like, love to do that. Beltrano, wouldn't you love to do that? <laughs> we'll put your lines in a special little hat. <laughs> Which one would it be? Which one would it be? Twisted. In which one did we shake the most? Oh, Kim, what's her name always did that one? The shake. Remember when we got the tapes? We were sent tapes to our homes, our respective homes. Shake. Just how to shake. Because in the middle of four pages of dialogue, Captain Janeway, standing alone on the bridge, you'd hear, shake, shake, shake. And we'd all have to shake. And sometimes some of us would forget to shake. And we'd have to go all the way back to the beginning. But which one would we choose, you guys? Which reunion episode are we going to do? Uh, well, I'd, I'd, I'd have to go with Twisted. I'd have to go with Twisted. <laughs> how, how about Night? The, the Captain's was Log? What's that? Captain. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <the>, uh, <laughs> remember Night, Kate? The which one? Night. night. I don't even remember what happened in Night. Well, that was the one with the Captain's Log. <laughs> I had a Captain's Log. <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, I'm sorry, sweetie pie, in the front row. Look at her. She started sitting up. Now she's in an absolute. Oh, finish the story. I think I'm not going to tell that story. What was the one with Species 8472? What was the one where I had, I copulated with Lieutenant Paris and we had little lizards? We had lizards. I'm sorry, dear. <laughs> Threshold. Threshold was the name of that. That yep. was the nader, wasn't it? Yeah, let's really have a rocking great yeah, the salamanders. <laughs> episode about Paris and Janeway in the turbo lift. <laughs> reproducing lizards. <laughs> that was called a bottle show, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I, I, think the, you know, I think the final episode would have been great to redo because I, I remember reading the, uh, the script and thinking the first hour was amazing. The second hour tied everything up too quickly. So I remember calling up the executive producers and I said, you, you really want to make this amazing? Film the first hour and then air that on TV and say, to be continued at a theater near you. And then a two-hour movie of us getting back home, right? To replace that god-awful Next Gen movie that came out in 2002, yes, sure. which was what? What was that? Nemesis, Insurrection, whatever. They're, those two were worse than any TNG episode, okay? So you could have had a Voyager two-hour movie, and we stepped foot on Earth like that. We didn't even step foot on Earth. We would end the show in orbit. What the hell is that? Okay, sorry. It was good. It was good. Oh, it was, it was good, good, but it could have been... We, it could have showed more. Code of Honor is the worst of all. So, but Kate, we could have got to Earth. We could have found out what happened to Janeway's dog. Well, there's so many things that we want to know we about. We did find out. We did. He's never even seen it. <laughs> we did. That's pretty good. In his own mind. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Who's next? Kate and uh, Robert, I can't remember your name, Icheb. Uh, I was wondering. Oh, <laughs> oh Icheb. Hey, hey Doc, let me tell you a story on that. I was, I, a couple years ago, I was doing Jay Edgar. Um, real quick story. Um, Clint Eastwood is directing it, and I'm doing the scene with Leonardo DiCaprio, so I'm really nervous. Clint Eastwood, when I first get on the set, he walks slowly across the stage, and he looks at me dead in the eye, and he goes, well... If it isn't Manu, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and elbowed me, so, um, yeah. It's okay. My name's Manu. Yeah. I was wondering if y'all three would be replaying your roles in the Star Trek Online. But Robert and, and me, I would love to do some work on Star Trek Online. I know some of these guys already have. Yeah. Um, but I know Icheb's hanging out on K7. I don't know what else he's doing, but I hope he does something. That would be great. All right. He's got, who is Robert. next? Yeah, who's next? I guess he called me Robert. <laughs> Come on up. Hi there. Sorry. Sorry, I have to do it justice. First, I have to say, Katie, you're awesome. You're wonderful. Thanks. Love all your shit, your roles, Thanks. including love Coneheads. I love all your heads. Love that movie. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Anyway, this is for the entire uh, cast. What were your some of your most memorable mem memorable? Mo memorable moments doing the entire show. Of the entire show? 
of the entire show. Sorry, sorry, it's it's. My m most memorable moment was always when they said, "That's a wrap." <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. My most memorable moment was meeting Tim Russ for the first time in the pilot episode. I walked up to him and I said, "Hi, I'm Garrett Wong." He's, like, I'm, "I'm Tim Russ," and I said, "You know what? If you take one letter from your character's name, Tuvok, and replaced it with another letter like P, you could have been Tupac." <laughs> okay. The rapper. That's so Tim that. doesn't respond to that. He just looks at me. <laughs> like that, right? <laughs> he gives me about five seconds of nasty look, and then he says something. He goes, rap music. <laughs> rap music is the reason for the fall of modern Western civilization. How, how can you dis, dis rap a, us rappers like that? Come on. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sure it wasn't quite said that way. I mean, Always I mean, was. That's okay. I'm pretty sure of the fall of the Western civilization. I mean, I'm going to give that <laughs> that much impact from rap music. I don't think so. But I did say something along that line. <laughs> what was your most memorable moment? Oh, I have, uh, I, as far as being on the show, um, you know, I got to tell you that, that uh, to me, it was, it was memorable because it was such a, such a trip to come to work this was near the end of the uh, series. It was like the last week or so we were shooting. And to come into the soundstage, you know, and I'm on one of the sets, and the set next to me is being taken apart while we're getting ready to do the scene. And that was, you know, an eye-opener. You know, it caught me off guard. I walked in there, and they're literally taking the set down. We've been living on these sets for seven years. So it was very, very, uh, uh, it was eye-opening, and it was uh, kind of stunning. So... It was a very strange, strange feeling. I don't know if Kate felt that or not, but it was just because they were tearing them down while we were well, still shooting. I, I would say, I, I was kept. You guys were all released one by one. Johnny, you went first. That was a terrible day. That was hard. At the end of the series, you were the first to be released. Do you remember? Maybe even two weeks in advance. I did a part on the final show, just, but it was just a... a conversation with seven of nine right but i know that you were the first to go we yeah. all had a, like a cake and a goodbye and tears and all that because he was so great right and then one by one finally there were a couple of days with us the group of us on the bridge and you lot were released and it was just me and i was kept for five days of close-ups and pickups for the entire season right just in case and i swear to god i sat in my captain's chair and I delivered every single line they gave me. I did it standing, I did engage, I did red alert, I did it sitting, I did it all for five days. And just as we were about to wrap, a crew guy came with his screwdriver and started to undo my chair. <laughs> <laughs> the chair is being dismantled, the consoles are being ripped from behind me, right? And I'm trying to do it, and nobody's there. Berman didn't come, none of the producers came. I was all alone, and finally I heard in from the darkness, well, that's it, Kate. Thanks for a great seven years, and that's a wrap. I stood there, I'm not kidding. I started to cry. Oh my God, is this it? When I saw silhouetted, in the briefing room door, this one, the doctor. The what gleam of light shining off my head. <laughs> Come here, Captain. Give me a hug. Let's go and have a drink. And that's why I say the memory is friendship. Hey, the night, the night we were filming the scene where... Um, uh, where uh, Roxanne, where Bellana Torres and Tom Paris get married because we were having a wedding scene. There was some sort of party atmosphere. And I remember sitting in Kate's tra trailer. And Kate, who played, you know, Captain Janeway, had this sort of like, it looked like a little English cottage in her trailer. She had, <laughs> she had like doilies and, a, and an upholstered chair. It was so unlike what she was doing on screen. It was kind of fun to be there. And we sat there, and I swear this is the only time I remember this in seven years. But... We decided, hey, we're going to a wedding. Let's have a cocktail. <laughs> I had a bar. Do you remember that? Did, did she you served that? me a drink, and then we went in and shot the scene. Fortunately, I didn't have to talk because one, you know, because I knew that I would be. We had nervous. more than one drink. Bob. Only one. 
before yeah. the scene. But I do. I remember that night sitting in her room. It seemed so civilized, you know, to 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 be there and having a little doily with a doily, <laughs> with a little cocktail napkin. <laughs> it was wonderful. Thank you so much. Next question, please. Hi, so uh, first I would like to thank you all. Y'all are actually the reason why I became a Trekkie. I was raised to be a Star Wars fan, and then I, uh, I found you alls show, in which my family was very like, oh my God, why? And then I was like, but look at Janeway, and, and look at the rest of the crew, man. they're amazing. And so uh, the, before my question, I would like to say my favorite episode, or at least one of my favorite episodes, is when Q tries to seduce Janeway. <laughs> You can call him John Delancey. Okay. <laughs> because it's just a hilarious episode. In the bathtub? Episode. Yeah, oh my gosh, so many, so many scenes were just too funny. But uh, talking about love, hey, Doc, what did you think about Dakota ending up with 7 and 9? How do I feel about that? Yeah. I think it was a terrible mistake. I agree. Yeah. I completely, yeah. no offense, think, Dakota, you know, but. We all make mistakes yeah, in life. Yeah, I, I agree. But that was a terrible mistake. Yes. So <laughs> I'm glad what you, you agree think? with me. Well, <laughs> it was a first uh, yeah, it, it, You know, Chakotay didn't have much um, to do with women during that show. Um, those seven years were very, very. Well, the captain, she turned me down for a monkey on the uh, when we were. Uh, <laughs> here we are, stranded on an uh, on a on a planet by ourselves, and I'm trying to go. And I, here's Chakotay trying to get close to the captain. She goes, oh, look, a monkey. <laughs> it was so strange. <laughs> you were combing my hair <laughs> and massaging mine. I was so interested in the little... <laughs> <laughs> He got lost in the rafters. <laughs> he went up, up, up. What was wrong with Janeway? I was riveted by that stupid monkey. <laughs> 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 it was sort of tough for me on that show too because I, I I was 21 when I got the part, but I was playing like 16. Yeah. And I I had a lot of scenes with Jerry Ryan. And just a lot of tight two shots where you're just, you're right there, you know? And you, and I was 21, did I mention when I, and it's very, it's something that, yeah, it's not shared a lot, but it's very hard to hide an erection in a Starfleet uniform. Oh my. Um, and so most of my memories are, are of just running off set for this reason or that reason to get a bagel or I got to go to the bathroom or I got to go talk to, you know, to get rid of my boner. <laughs> see, you, man. See, you, see you, man, about a horse. Now, if you remember, yes, Chakotay ended up with seven and before it was the doctor, but before the doctor, Kim had his chance. <laughs> yeah. Remember that? That horrible episode where Kim invites Seven of Nine to the mess hall under the guise of doing work. The lights are down low, right? I'm reading the script as an actor going, oh, this is great. Yes, you know. And then Seven of Nine calls Ensign Kim's bluff. Ensign, are you? You seem aroused or whatever she says. And then she says the immortal words, do you wish to copulate, right? And I'm reading this as an actor going, yeah! And then I read my lines, dot, 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 no. <laughs> I flipped the page, like, where is it? Just kidding, just yeah, kidding. I no, was, it wasn't there. After, when we filmed that scene that day, I remember the director goes, cut. Jerry Ryan looks at me and she goes, you lost out. <laughs> she turns to the rest of the crew there, the sound guy, the cameraman. She goes, any takers? They're like, ooh, ooh, me, me, me. And Sin Kim is a wuss, he won't do it, me. <laughs> So I was supposed to be the one, not the doctor, not Chakotay, but Kim. But because of the damn writers, yeah, we didn't see that. Yeah. Dialogue betrayed you. Thank you so much, guys. Can, it, I ask, can I ask a question of you? Did you even kiss Seven of Nine? Passionately? We did have one kiss, but I was a hologram. Um, <laughs> wait a minute, wait so, a minute. That's so, my line. 
So I could only enjoy it as Robert Beltran. Um, yeah, we did kiss once, I think. Yeah. It was uh, such I, a fast romance, wasn't I, it? Yeah, it was very fast. Um, but, you know, I, I, um, I, challenged, I challenged Jerry. I said, Jerry, uh, we were sitting in the, t in the makeup table, and, and I said, Jerry, you know, since you're going out with Brannon, who was one of the chief writers, he'll never write a scene where you and I kiss. He's too jealous. He would never write where you and I kiss. And she said, oh, my God, I'm going to tell him what you just said. And I'm like, I think it's so funny. Well, like two episodes later, he, they, that's when they threw us together. And um, he wrote me a note and said, who's jealous? <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you something about Seven of Nine. Um, she was wearing this derma regenerating suit, right? This is the th reason it was so tight. Too. They were regenerating her skin. It was a derma regenerating. She wore it for, what, four years? No, I said, hey, let's take it off and see if it worked. <laughs> Come on. What the hell is going on here? All right, all right. We're moving along here. We're moving on. <laughs> Suffice it to say, you all had a relationship with Seven of Nine. What's the next question? Uh, my question was, um, were you guys ever fans of the other franchises, um, Deep Space Nine, TNG? Did you guys ever have any dialogue with I was the other a cast members? Absolutely uh, huge, not. Next question. Question. Huge fan of Enterprise. <laughs> I was a huge fan of Enterprise, so I have all of them on DVD. Um, what are you talking about? It's the series that came after us. You didn't watch it? Scott Bakula and, uh, um, uh, um, Dracula. Uh, it was great. Come on, Tim, come out of the closet. Tim's a real Star Trek fan. Come oh, on. yes, you are. No, I, I, yes. I, no, I, it, when I was growing up, we only had, you know, when I was in Drac in the old days. And we used to walk. That was a short we used path. to walk uphill both ways to school and back. We didn't have a television. We, have a television. Yeah. we had people come over and do hand shadows. Oh. That was our entertainment. Uh, we only had three channels, and that was with an antenna television. It wasn't cable. Oh uh, yeah, just in my case, a coat hanger for an antenna. But it was an antenna. We had three channels. We had uh, the reruns of, let me count them, I Love Lucy, Gilligan's Island, and Star Trek. You know, I'm as familiar with Star Trek as I am with Gilligan's Island. <laughs> we didn't, I didn't get cast in Gilligan's Island remakes, so that's it. So that was how, I mean, it was on every single day, every other day, every week, every year for a very long time. And I was familiar with it. I have not watched the subsequent, the other shows, uh, DS9 and the rest of them. I'd say the same it. thing. I, I, I was a fan of the original, wait a minute, wait a minute, the wait a original cast. Yeah. Lieutenant, I, I, Commander, is there, what's in your pocket? funky ringer there, man. Hello, I'm kind of... <laughs> 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 not a good time. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Bob. That's right, Bob. Thank you. Next question. Anybody else? Um, okay, uh, first of all, no, I didn't, <laughs> not yet. Um, first off, um, I'm a huge fan of Kate. I've wanted to meet her since I was seven. Um, Did you say be her or meet her? <laughs> Either way, okay. Either way. Um, my question was, um, in that episode, it was called Memorial. You guys had like a lot of emotional acting in that one episode. Um, I was wondering what you guys did to prepare for that because, you know, throughout the whole series, it was not, you know, wasn't anything like that. What happened in Memorial? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Memorial was that beacon that was sending out a message, and it was basically uh, we were reliving the massacre that happened. Uh, one, that one alien race came which, in. Which alien species? Yeah, which, you know, which species it was? Oh, the... Blah, blah, blah. Did, did I have anything to say other than, Captain, I believe there's a the subspace uh, anomaly. <laughs> now, here's the thing said. I want to say to this gentleman who asked the question nicely. You immediately assume we remember exactly <laughs> what happened. That's true. That's oh, true. We don't, do we? <laughs> nope. Huh? Nope. Uh, furthermore, as to the uh, capacity for emotion on our series, uh, I believe that that uh, uh, was something that we all did with fair ease, don't you think? Yeah. Why do uh, I suddenly sound as if I'm on some sort of tranquilizer? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't an unusual thing to be emotional on Voyager. Janeway was quite emotional. 
and Paul fell out of the room. <laughs> Do you think, don't you think that we were emotional people? Um, not in oh, the beginning. I mean, Most of you guys, I wasn't. I, caretaker. <laughs> I, I had to play the caretaker straight man. Caretaker was very emotional, and our last scene together was wonderfully emotional. Uh, the one in the, was it in the briefing room? You had Alzheimer's, sweetheart. I oh, visited well, you. That was the last <laughs> episode when I was going crazy, yes. That was Alzheimer's, crazy. That you was had. wild, yes. That was wild. Deeply emotional. Yeah. Anyway. I, Kate, do you, uh, do you guys remember when we had that lunch with Rick Berman in the very beginning? And we, we got the role on... Had I been hired yet? Yes, we'd all been hired. Yeah. And um, Berman, Rick Berman, the executive producer, said, congratulations to all of you getting your roles on Voyager. And uh, for those of you playing human characters, which would be Kate, uh, Beltran, myself, um, he, Robbie, he said, uh, you guys need to downplay your delivery of your lines. You need to be more two-dimensional, less emotional, more militaristic, which in my book, it just looks like bad acting. Um, but he said, you must do that to make the aliens look real. He said this, and I thought, this is ridiculous. Why would I do that? But I was my first job, I didn't speak up. But, and he then followed that up with, if you fail to follow my dictate, then I will then send a memo to you where you will have to reshoot that scene. And you'll have to reshoot and reshoot until you do it the way I want you to do it. So the first season, I reshot two scenes, and then I ended up towing the line and just doing this two-dimensional delivery to make the aliens look real, which I thought was ridiculous. But Kate, I recall you reshot 30 or so, I mean, several, many, many scenes. Do you not recall any of that? No, Ensign. <laughs> I don't recall that I reshot. The, in season one? Well, it was nerve-wracking, wasn't it? Mm. Don't forget I wasn't the first choice, ladies and gentlemen. It was uh, Jean-Pierre Bougeot, the great French-Canadian actress, who very wisely, and I say to this day bravely, left after a good 48 hours because she knew it wasn't for her. Oh, boy. Right? Very smart. And yeah. also, she couldn't say the crucial word. No. Take after take after take, she came onto the bridge. She greeted you all. She took the captain's chair and she said, Engage. Engage! <laughs> <laughs> Is that not true? Well, okay, very, okay. There was only two people that were on the set when she was working. It was Robbie McNeil and myself. Yeah, You're right. Myself she had well. a problem. You were not yes, there. I was. No, I you weren't. Scene, I did the scene Below with her. Wait a minute, you wait a minute. Tim Russ, Tim Russ. You were I a Maquis guy. Remember that? No, you were with no. When, when Genevieve Bougeau was on the set, I did the scene with her. I did the scene three or four times. What? Before Kate. Just tell me the truth. I'll did she say on God or not? Well, no. This is what happened, Kate. She did her thing. She had problems with basic techno babble. She did a pregnant pause before stuff like, I will meet you at the double lift, like that, because she had to pause because, the you know, the English to French, whatever. But when she came around <laughs> and sat down, she did an independent film take of Engage. She sat down and she went, she closed her eyes and when she went, Engage. She whispered it. And we, everybody on set was like, oh my goodness. Like the cameraman was like, ah. Uh. <laughs> we were like, that is not a captain. And so then we waited. We waited for the new captain to come in. Then you came in and you were like, da 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 da. You sat there and you went, engage. And we were like, yes! Yes! So it was night and day between her delivery and your delivery. Oh, and her yeah. delivery was, was not apropos. Don't you think she was really marvelous the way she did that? She could have really screwed the... Excuse me. <laughs> she could have. She could have delayed that decision, yes. and it could have been... Manu, I'm sorry, are we keeping you? <laughs> I mean, Everybody's got a fool. <laughs> the fact that she left after 48 hours was uh -huh. the best thing she could have done. Yes, yeah. I agree with you. Great. Yeah, it's true. First of all, I want to say that... I, oh. I, I hate it when you two fight like that. <laughs> Publicly, it just breaks my heart. But... But the thing I remember from the first luncheon that we were all out with Rick Berman, because I don't remember anything that you just said, but I do remember he said the words, uh, as I look across all of your happy faces, it's hard to believe that a few years from now, you'll all be suing Paramount. <laughs> he actually said that. Do you remember it? I totally remember that line. And I looked at everybody else like, did he just say that? <laughs> and he said, and he did. Yeah, I guess because the original series guys lawsuit that had gone on for 27 years or whatever had just been resolved because you know all those posters and everything and the lunch boxes and everything in the original series those guys didn't get paid for like 25 years for their images you know so they had That's just right. settled the lawsuit and i guess paramount was smarting but i do remember 
he said that to us. Were we all gathered at that lunch? Yeah. As far was as Jen Lean yeah. there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have no memory of that lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, Kate. I don't remember either. It was just unbelievable. You don't remember it? I remember just going to the set that day and they oh. taking a walk through the sets and stuff. I don't remember. I'll tell lunch. you what I remember. For six months of the brass standing and watching me. Those guys in suits just watching and waiting for me to screw up. <laughs> right? Don't you guys remember that? Yeah. It was horrifying. Yeah. Really terrible. Don't you have pity? <laughs> Do we yes, have another question? we got over that fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Go ahead, dear. Hi. Um, I've been watching you guys since I was like two, probably. <laughs> I grew up watching uh, Star Trek, and would you mind if I told you something, like, it's kind of embarrassing, but um, <laughs> when I was in elementary, like, third or fourth grade, so I was like eight or nine, I used to, um, there were these two trees in our recess place, and I used to pretend that was the bridge, <laughs> and um, I would go around, and I would play the captain, and I played Tuvok, and Chicote and the doctor, and and some, and um, even me, like, and I used to play all of you guys and walk around, and I'd sit, I'd like squat down, I'd say, engage. <laughs> and so, um, that's not my question, though. I was gonna ask. <laughs> oh, but that's great. Good story. Very good story. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, everyone else thought I was weird because I'd walk around and say, live long and prosper. And I'd like, everyone that I came up to, they're like, she's so. Well, wait a minute, sweetie. You played all the parts all by yourself. Didn't you have little playmates playing other parts? No, they all thought I was weird. Oh, don't. <laughs> they thought I was like, they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, Star Trek. Did Why you did you that? squat when you said engage? <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> because you used to sit. <laughs> Yeah, you didn't have a stump or oh, something to sit on or a chair? No, no. She was only two you years old. Well, no, I was eight at the time. She was doing a lot of squatting at that age. She was, was two. She was two. I, mean, I was eight when I used oh. to do that. Oh, you were um, eight? Yes. And, um, yeah, it was, I used to, because you used to sit down and say engage, but I didn't. But I a, never squatted I, here. <laughs> that would have been I most unbecoming. <laughs> I can't believe Captain Janeway's making fun of you. <laughs> you. You told us a very heartfelt, touching story, and she's making fun of you. <laughs> Shame on you. But I would have loved your story. I would have loved to have seen her squat and say the line. <laughs> All right, what's your question, sweetheart? Um, I was gonna ask you which one. Who's your favorite species? Like, what's your favorite species? Oh, Eight four seven two for me. I love the Vidians. The Vidians were, they ate human flesh. <laughs> I love them, yeah. They really looked like they I ate human flesh. I think the Kazon flesh. were really lame, though. The Kazon were terrible. Remember that guy lame. in the bathroom? <laughs> Who was the guy in the bathroom? Patrick killed Patrick. Patrick killed Patrick. What did he do in the bathroom? My, favorites, my favorite species were the Trabe. Remember the Trabe Trabe. from Sacred Ground? They had vaginas on their forehead. <laughs> Honest to God. My, my favorite were the Kazon. Uh, they were the star, you know, traveling race from planet to planet and so forth. But they couldn't find water. <laughs> couldn't find, had no water. <laughs> what is the water? Where's the water? <laughs> what kind of You've it's... got starships for gosh. You've got to be able but to they make... were always, weren't they? But they Where's could? the water? <laughs> <laughs> Beltran, remember those aliens that were the catcher mask people, right? And there were these two actors that were cast, and they were from Brooklyn. They were like, anyway, so uh, Captain Janeway, I mean, they were just, <laughs> we're just going to ask you if we can, uh, go, you know, see if we could trade with you and stuff, you know? I mean, it's... Well, well, there was one that was, like, from Brooklyn, and then there was this other guy that was, like, very English. <laughs> what are you doing in our airspace? <laughs> and the guy behind him was going, yeah, what are you doing here? <laughs> I never could figure out why all the alien bad guys had English accents, you know? <laughs> Always wanted one to be, at least one to be like, Latino, you know? <laughs> hey, what are you doing in our airspace, eh? Hey? <laughs> I 
And you didn't even bring a beer? <laughs> Oh, Beltran tells me the story. He's driving. He says he's driving oh, home, God. and he sees these two, you know, kind of gang banging guys on the side of the street, and they're looking at him, all stared at him, and he's thinking he's gonna get carjacked, right? He's like, oh my gosh, oh my, and they're looking and looking, and all of a sudden one of them goes, hey, it's the commander. <laughs> God, I, I can't believe I, I blanked on his name, our amazing makeup guy. Michael, uh, Westmore. Michael Westmore, genius, had to make the alien of the week. Every week we had to have a new species, right? Because we're in a news part of space. And one episode, I don't remember what it was, but I'm over this guy at sickbay. It's a very dramatic scene, and the alien looks exactly like Bozo the Clown. <laughs> he has a white face, he's got green bags under his eyes, and he's got red hair. He's Bozo! <laughs> and we, and, and the, poor, the director goes, I see the director going, this is him. This is him. <laughs> and then we're trying to shoot this. And they could never, like, shoot down because it was a German. And the poor guy, he was a wonderful actor, and he's dying, but he's Bozo. <laughs> and, like, we, had to, we couldn't keep the camera on him long. Do a quick shot of, you know, before he looks too Bozo. <laughs> Do you remember? The, he was the clown. And I thought, I, and, and it's the same thing with the trade when the, uh, yeah, you just run out of things no, to but, put on them. <laughs> but we had a real clown played by that very good actor. Jesus, we're all so old now, we can't remember anything. <laughs> Who was that great? Michael, Michael... Mike McKean, Michael McKean. Oh, Michael. Michael McKean, yeah, from... He was a Spinal clown. Yeah. No, no, but that, no, no, that was a different episode. Well, I'm talking about, we had a guy on the uh, sick bay on the tape. That was, yeah, that was a different one. That was, uh, he was supposed to be a clown. This was an unintentional clown. <laughs> <laughs> Does that answer your well. question? And that's yes, a, that's sir. A thank you so much. I want to thank you, darling. That was a wonderful story. That was the best one. Thank you, love. Thank you. Can you take one more? Yeah. One more question. Oh, gee, and one more question, and I get to be the one to do that. That is no pressure. Um, now, uh, I saw Garrett uh, a little bit, a little while ago, uh, and he mentioned uh, Code of Honor. And he did a whole 30 minutes on stage of how Code of Honor was the most god-awful episode in all of TNG. Um, I just wanted to kind of ask, uh, and hopefully this isn't a silly question, what's maybe your f uh, worst and favorite episode, uh, preferably of Voyager uh, itself, but if you guys want to go crazy and just uh, do Trek in general... Go nuts. <laughs> well, we had these shows called bottle shows. They were intended to save money. Right, that meant we were not going on location. Everything was going to be on the ship. Sure. That's when I was reproducing with Lieutenant Paris <laughs> in the turbo lift. That's my all-time worst. Can you imagine? <laughs> uh, Why are you laughing? <laughs> <laughs> Poor uh, Robbie was just. Fa <laughs> Go ahead. Favorite episode. Um, Death wish. Uh, Imperfection was an episode where I saved Seven's cortical note, and I had to give up my own to give it to her. Um, and I was at home, and I was uh, 21 or 22, and I hadn't done a whole lot of work. I, I'd done uh, a really lame movie called Whatever It Takes, a geek film. But I, it, this was my biggest role. Um, I was 21. And I read the script, and it, it was very powerful, and I knew that we were going to affect people. I was going to affect people, it, it, their emotions, That's in a big way. That's an incredibly powerful episode, yeah. Yeah, I, and so I called my mom, and I remember crying, talking to her, saying, Mom, I finally get to do what I came out here to do. I think I'm, I'm going to do something that counts, you know? Seriously, like, bawling. And then we shot the episode, and a year later, I'm doing my first convention in Germany, and this guy stands up with his brother and says something to the effect of, you know, I, I really want to thank you for imperfection it got my cousin or my brother i don't remember through his kidney transplant and they both thanked me and they had tears in their eyes oh, and it rocked me and i started crying to them they started crying back and i said i called my mom and and, the, and honestly i'm not trying to be funny because that that's what this whole thing of acting is about trying to affect emotions and 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 get that connection so th i was so proud to do that work that episode my least favorite episode Getting ready for this, I decided to go back and watch some of it because I'd never seen any of it before. But I wanted to like know what you guys had done a little bit. Um, <laughs> Evidently, you were amused. Yeah. No, no. Uh, I watched the pilot, which was good, but there was an episode I tried to watch called Tuvix. <laughs> 
Oh, we didn't like I, that I got guy. about four minutes in, and I, I just, the guy freaked me out, man. I was just... <laughs> But he freaked everybody out. Yeah. Remember that guy? That was Tom. That was Tom, Tom Wright. Tom he was Wright. not a Tom happy Wright. big guy. He was uh, not happy at no, all. That he guy. Sure knew. He man, he had a tuck. He had a tough He's an job. extraordinary actor. I've done yeah. plays with him, and yeah, he was not. He's very good. He had, and he had to play both of us. You know, he came to the time. show early to watch us, yeah. and uh, I think he was the guy in Seinfeld who used to cut his Snickers with a fork and knife. If you remember, um, what a great actor. A tough job. To great actor, but that's also my worst alien species. The two of us. Well, there was only one guy. Um, I, didn't, I didn't watch much of the show. I watched some from the first season, and then I didn't watch it. And so I only remember from what performing in it what I had the most fun as an actor with, and I would say Mortal Coil for me, because it was the most existential show um, for me, uh, where we don't know what the hell is coming after we die. Nobody has any videos. All this certainty that... Uh, uh, people preach is to me a crock, uh, <laughs> but I also don't know if there's nothing. So uh, uh, in that show, Neelix is forced to embrace the uncertainty of, of life, and Beltran's character tells him, uh, you know, we don't know what's going on, but as long as you're here, you know, you can be kind. And I, I thought it was a very powerful show. Um, and uh, my least favorite probably was Knight, because I didn't want to look at that guy look, who looked like a stool. <laughs> uh, it just did not, it was not fun. <laughs> Do you remember that? We could hardly get through one take. He looked like a big piece of poo. Big, big piece of poo. Yeah. It was terrible. I remember that guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember that. Log. I didn't have any okay. lines with him. Oh, uh, oh, impossible. We had these deadly earnest scenes together, right? And it was like... Uh, <laughs> look, look at it. They were testing us, weren't they? I'm sorry. That's all right. Um... Uh, just to comment on Two Vicks, I love the Two Vicks episode, and that actor I thought was amazing. And I remember, you know, when he, when he left and Tim Russ came back. I'm sorry, Tim, but I was kind of like, oh, I was like, I was. That guy was awesome. Anyway, okay. Anyway, um, I still love you, Tim. Don't worry. Okay. Tupac. Tupac. Hi. Okay. So. Um, my favorite episode was Timeless, which is the 100th episode where the ship crashes in the ice planet and two people are left alive, Chakotay and Kim. And then 15 years later, Kim has to save the day. And that was great because when we were filming that episode where I might make everything right, I was filming with good old Bob Picardo here. And Bob was like, Garrett, you can act. It was like, it was like the first time that he realized like, Polite. I was totally respectful. You were spectacular in that show. Thank you. But it was kind of, but you gave me this look like a, you, that, that you'd never, well, I'd just never seen it before. <laughs> 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 Fine. Touche. Um, my least favorite episode was probably um, The Shoot. Not because it was a bad episode. The Shoot was where. Uh, the Shoot. The Shoot. <laughs> the Shoes. The Shoes. Yeah, there the was shoe. an episode where the shoes. Shoes. Yeah, the shoes. Where was that no. for that one? Yeah. Uh, the alien prison ship, where Paris and Kim were in the alien prison ship, that one. Um, because we, it was blood, sweat, and tears. We, everyone in the crew got bronchitis. I got bronchitis. For, um, we got cut, you know, blood, this and that. So it was a really difficult uh, episode to film. But that was the one episode where Kim kind of flipped around and he became the mentor to Paris, if you remember that. The scene is Paris is on the ground. He's lying there, and I'm waving off the other aliens trying to come up to us. He's, he's been stabbed. And I remember filming that scene. I'm going, get back, get back. And I stepped on Robbie McNeil by mistake, right? And he goes, ow! And then I, he lies there and he goes, I hate not being the hero. <laughs> I go, be quiet like that. I was like, just. So, anyway, those are mine. Uh, I think my least favorite was Twisted. Was it Twisted or Shatter? The one. Twisted. The one uh, Twisted, where the. In, here's the plot of the show <laughs> The inter interior space of Voyager has been shifted around mysteriously. So when you go into a room expecting the mess hall, it's sick bay. So here's what we did for 43 minutes. We'd walk through a door and go, <laughs> that was the show. That was the whole, that was the whole thing. Oh, well, this is not where I expected to be. <laughs> for 43 minutes. All right, my favorite episode, just because I got to put my hand on the captain's ass. Tinker Tenor, Dr. Spy, in, in the briefing room, when all three of our, uh, our female officers are pitching themselves at me and Janeway trumps them all by taking my hand and putting it on her lower back pain, ho, ho, ho. It was great to feel the seat of power.
Uh, it was great uh, to share it, uh, darling. Uh, oh, that's I great. had a lot of favorite ones because I always liked the ones that were badly written. <laughs> and so I had a lot of choices. Um, but one of them was... <laughs> One of them was uh, the one where I was trying to convince you, Captain, that you guys, that I was coming from another time and uh, place and... Was it Shattered? Shattered. shattered. Yeah. And so uh, I always used to ask, ask uh, silly qu questions, you know, like uh, on the set, we're like, what the hell does a warp particle look like? <laughs> you know? But um, so I was, I was sick of this episode and I said, look, why don't I just take the Kate out, uh, take Kate to the window, and we can look outside and see that the stars are different. We're not in that part of space anymore. We're scientists, are we not? And so, if we're traveling around, we wouldn't look. The, the constellation would, would look different. And so, <laughs> and so, uh, this made too much sense. Uh, so, that was one of my favorite ones. The other one uh, involved uh, Tim and T Garrett. You remember this? Uh, it was the Klingons, and they had, they had captured us, and they were pushing us down. And there was, this, there was this one guy who was kind of effete, let's put it that way. And um, he, was, he was the one that was pushing Tim down. Um, and so, he, you know, the Klingons were, like, pushing us down, and we had to be on our knees like this. Well, this guy was being really rough with Tim, and he was going, get down! And I, I was cracking up with Garrett, and I said, watch, watch. Tim's not going to take this too much longer. <laughs> so, and then the guy would go, with his gun. <laughs> so, um, about the third take, he pushed Tim down, and Tim goes, don't do that again. <laughs> one more time. One, once. Just once. That's all. And the guy was like, <laughs> Well, you guys remember a lot more than I can remember. Yeah. Uh, I just had a favorite episode, which was actually a two-parter. Uh, uh, Future's uh, not Future's End. It was yeah, Future's End. It was the two-parter, the uh, time travel uh, one. I think it was that the one uh, two-parter, um, which I thought was. I had a great time shooting it because we were two weeks off uh, this off the soundstage. We were all over L.A. on location. It's springtime. It was beautiful weather. And I worked with Sarah oh, Silverman, Sel Sarah Silverman, for that whole time. She was a, a hoot to work with, and, and it was me and Robbie. And we just running around. Remember on the beach, and we're over here. Fun. Oh Fun. man, that was a kick in the pants. That was wonderful. I just enjoyed it so much. Yep. Um, I have the great pleasure of saying to you all that I couldn't possibly begin to count the wonderful times I had, the great episodes that I had, because I got to sh many times over had deep things with Neelix, wonderful times with you in the galley, cooking. Our strange little... <laughs> you had the best lines. Of course you enjoyed I it. I had great lines, but I had, to, I had a wonderful flirtation with you and the star. The doctor and I became great friends. I loved you in the end. You were my dearest dear, and then you died of Alzheimer's. But I think the one... <laughs> I think the one that I remember as being so provocative and the single greatest seismic shift in Janeway was Death Wish. We'd seen her there too for as this rather rigid militant. I mean, I was really an adherent of the Prime Directive and I was all, you know, for all the Star Trek thing. What is it called? Starfleet philosophy. <laughs> and Q comes to me with his nephew and the nephew wants to, uh, uh, wants to be judged on his right to commit suicide. I am adamantly opposed to it because it is against the prime, it's against everything that we're, we believe in. And over the course of that episode, Janeway is allowed to take that marvelous journey, philosophically, uh, deep, deep internal journey where she transcends her, herself in a way. So it was a, a beautiful exploration of, of who she really was, who, how much she is capable of understanding others and other species. And at the end, I said to John Delancey, Q, he has every right to choose how he wishes to live or not to live this life. And I thought that was pretty great. Very cool. Pretty great. <laughs> Most of it, ladies and gentlemen, was pretty great. I have to tell you that, because these yeah. guys are pretty great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
I believe that might be the end of our time. Can we give one more big round of applause for the amazing cast of Star Trek Voyager? <laughs>